I'm Steve Hyden, cultural critic for Uprox, and I am joined today by two music icons. Chuck D. Tom Morello. Prophets of Rage. I feel like the entire nation right now is trying to figure out why our president seems so reluctant to call out racist neo-Nazis and white supremacists. We should be totally pissed off by what happened in Charlottesville and what our president's saying. I mean, he is clearly on record at who he's representing. He knows damn well that there's a contingent out there that he inspired and made rise with all the rhetoric he was spitting on that, you know, on that campaign. I know the, the original idea was that you felt like you know, rage songs, public enemy songs, that sure. these songs were needed, that sure. they needed to be yeah, played. Yeah, yeah. What are you hoping that people, like if they come to see your show, yeah. I know that you, I know you probably want them more than just than just to have a good time, that you yeah. want them to have a deeper experience. Like what is, I guess, in your heart of well, hearts? I, can like, what you, you I mean, for? first of all, that, first of all, it is very important that they have a good time. Yeah. I mean, because we are, in, uh, with the reason why I picked up a guitar and why Chuck picked up a microphone and why we play music is because of the visceral feeling of like rock and roll, hip hop, punk rock satisfaction that we had. Yeah. And if we can't convey that on a record or at a show, then nobody cares what you're talking about. Then it's, right. I mean, I love Noam Chomsky, but I'm not, you know, he's not gonna rock a field of 80,000 <laughs> people in Belgium. Right. That's what we do. Right. <laughs> so first and foremost, the message is in the mosh pit. This was a band that didn't just happen, you know, we didn't put together to play some festival shows. Right. We came together during the tumultuous electoral season of 2016 because it felt like it was a chaotic political time where Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders were being, being described as candidates that were raging against the machine. We're like, well, hold on, hold on. <laughs> we may not have trademarked the phrase, but, we, but we, we have an opinion about what that really means. We felt that it was not enough to hashtag about what was going on or tweet about or Instagram what was going on. I mean, those are small arrows in the quiver, but there's a big arrow in the quiver, and that's rock and roll music, which can steal the backbone of those who are fighting injustice and put wind in the sails of a movement that will hopefully lead to a more just and sane United States of America. I mean, do you think it's morally righteous to punch a Nazi in the face? Are you fucking kidding me? Was it? <laughs> <laughs> Resistance to injustice happened before Donald Trump, it'll happen during Donald Trump, it'll happen after Donald Trump. So it's like, can it get worse? Of course it can get worse. The Nazis and the KKK have unhooded themselves mm -hmm. because they've taken off the hoods in the Oval Office so they feel more comfortable taking off the hoods on the streets. It's very important that, that culture and music speaks as loud as being a voice because we can't rely on government. Things don't fix itself, you gotta make it happen. It seems like you guys put together songs like pretty quickly. I mean, is it intimidating at all though, when you have the kind of legacies that you guys have, to create something new that you know people are gonna compare to what you've already done? To me, always. But that's the challenge. You gotta go, I mean, every time we stepped on the stage, you're going up against Mount Everest here and the Himalayas over there, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, you, I mean, look man, it's, it's no gray area. You have to come and win, yeah. you have to win. I mean, give me a sense of like how unique that is, because I mean, you both have worked with a lot of different musicians. Yeah. yeah. I mean, is it hard to find? Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I, there's no crystal ball I could have looked into, you know, with my tennis racket, my Kiss <laughs> posters. That like I would be in, you know, Rage and Audio Slave and Prophets Rage, three different bands that somehow have managed to kind of find their own version of greatness. And it's, uh, I just feel like Public Enemy and Cypress Hill were the two principal hip hop influences on Rage Against the Machine, yeah. you know? And those were the, the PE was in our DNA and the Bomb Squad production and Terminator X were huge influences on me as a guitar player, you know? Like the sound collages and the rhythmic stuff. I tried to think less Chuck Berry and more Terminator X in you know, the beginning days of Rage. Um, and then Cypress Hill, that was the record that and Cypress Garden's Bad Motorfinger were the two records that were on non-stop repeat when we wrote the first Rage record. And somehow I'm in a band with Be Real and Chuck D. Like there's no, it's like it's, it's outrageous. <laughs> <laughs> and I've never been in a, I've never been in a failing band. And this idea of like iconography and music and how that can be used to package ideas that are very powerful for people. How does that inform what you're doing now with Prophets of Rage? I mean, do you feel like that combination can really galvanize people when they hear it? And like, and like why does that work so well, you think? It's been our experience you know, over the course of some decades now that that is, can be a very impactful experience. From my, the first time I put on a PE cassette or a Clash record, that is the experience that seems to happen with the number of the records we made. We hope it happens with this one too. Here's the thing, if you're a band, if you're any of you in a band out there in TV land, either fucking mean it or don't do it, you know? And we've, I've, we've never not meant it. Play as if everybody's soul in the room is at stake. 
you know? And if you do that, it's gonna resonate.